This is Dylan Sin uh, from the Journal Gazette in Fort Wayne. Um, hey Dylan, thank you for you doing, doing this. Man? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, we, we miss you up here in Fort Wayne. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for doing this. We all appreciate it. And I guess I just wanted to know, um, obviously, you were at Michigan State for 10 years. You were a Michigan guy. What was the decision making process like for you to to leave a, a, and come back to Indiana? Well, the first part is I, you know, like a I've said, I, this is the first time I've been offered a job at Indiana. And uh, I was waiting for Alex Bozich to offer me one from inside the hall, but that never happened. Um, so this is really my first time uh, being offered a job. And that's, you know, I think there's there's certain things that I've worked for in a certain position I've, I've earned um, with respect to, you know, the college basketball coaching ranks. So I wasn't going to do, you know, come for just anything. I probably would have come and worked for Alex. Um, but when Coach Woodson called and, and told me, um, you know, kind of the job description and the responsibilities, um, it was a pretty easy decision for me uh, from that respect. But uh, the fact that I had to leave East Lansing, I'm 45 minutes from my hometown, and um, that was the tough decision was really that, working for literally one of the best to ever do it in my mind and um, being close to my parents. Uh, my brother lives in Ann Arbor and uh, I'd been home for the last 11 years. So otherwise uh, to have a chance and come and work for coach Woodson, to work with coach Mata, to work with somebody like Scott Dolson that I've known for 20 years. Matter of fact, Scott is the one that, that got me my GA spot. Back then it wasn't a GA. I don't know what I was. I was a graduate video coordinator, but Scott went out and spoke to somebody, a major donor by the name of Larry Globinger, who, who um, donated the money for me to have to, to earn my master's. And so um, to be able to work for people that, that, that I've known for a long time and respected for a long time was an easy decision. Alex. Dane, Alex Bozich inside the hall. Um, this is kind of a loaded question, but you've been in the Big Ten now for, you know, since the early 2000s in and out, obviously, but with Michigan State the last 10 years and kind of look at Indiana basketball over that period of time. Michigan State is kind of a program that, that and Wisconsin and a few others kind of benefited from Indiana, maybe not being um, – as good as it once was, what do you think needs to happen to kind of get this program back up into that conversation, the upper echelon on a more consistent basis? Well, when you take a look at last year's team, you know, I think that, um, you know, they, they didn't have a ton of depth at the big spot with, with Brunk being hurt, but that was an NCAA tournament team. And, um, you know, we can, we can look at the players and look at the coaches, but I think this is a, uh, culture issue, not just with the program itself, but with the fans, the media, uh, the whole state. And I'm sorry to hold you accountable and, and say that you're responsible, Alex, but you're part of it and uh, not in a bad way. You're part of that. What makes Indiana uh, great. And all you guys, uh, and, and I'll probably talk to you, all you guys today, but um, you know, there's a certain um, component to Indiana basketball that I've always especially when I was playing here, that um, it's, a, it's a layer of insulation that I like to call it that protects the program from, from when they're struggling. And it doesn't mean you, you, you don't tell the truth or, or you know, create fluff to, to insulate the program, but it's, it's a responsibility. And it's a responsibility for those that love the program in particular, the former players, coaches, managers, uh, but it's a responsibility of this current staff. And I think even as important, you know, for, for you guys that uh, make a living off of uh, reporting on Indiana and Indiana University sports and Indiana basketball, um, it's as much, in my opinion, your job to, uh, to tell the good stories um, and make sure that, um, you know exactly what's going on instead of just writing a column. Um, and you know exactly what's going on because like Coach Izzo, my former boss always said is, 
the one thing you can't get away with is BS in the Indiana fans and the Indiana media because they know basketball. The problem is, is basketball has changed so much in the last 20 years. Kids, yes, they've changed, but what their head is filled with has changed. And if you're not up to date as a, as a columnist or a reporter, then, then, you know, it's your responsibility to come in and communicate with the staff and make sure you guys are all working together to get this thing. We're all working together to get this thing right. Tom, thank you. Hello, Dane. Nice to meet you finally. Um, one of the, uh, I know you and Mike are 20 something years apart age wise, but what's your relationship been with him through the years and how much time have you spent with him? Uh, Zero. I'm not even sure we've met. Um, I've known him. I've known of him. Um, lots of respect for him, Tom, but um, this is just something that you're automatically connected. It's going to take some time for him to get to know me. And one of my struggles is, you know, you're, you're supposed to recruit to your boss. And I'm used to recruiting to Tom Izzo. And this is a totally different philosophy thought process. You know, Coach Woodson comes from the NBA. I got to figure out what types of players that work best with him. And we all do. Um, you know, I, I still tend to think that character obviously matters with a player, but um, maybe it's someone like coach Woodson that can, that can turn around a kid's life from that aspect. Someone that doesn't have is, isn't known for the best, having the best character. Maybe coach Woodson's someone that can take somebody who has questionable character, but it's a great basketball player. You know, the great thing about it is we do have choices here in college. You know, we're not relying on a GM to just throw us some players. We have choices. But what I've got to do is, is figure out which players are the best players for Coach Woodson that fit his system. Mike Schumann. Yeah, hi, Dane. Mike Schumann with the Daily Hoosier. I wanted to Mike. ask you, hey, how's it going? I wanted to ask you about Rob Fennessy. He, he's a guy that had some really bright moments against MSU over the last few years, including some impressive defense against Cassius Winston. But but he also is a guy that struggled with confidence at times. And I, I recall you at one point saying you struggled earlier in your career with confidence. I, I'm just wondering kind of what your impressions of him as a player are and what do you hope that you can help to bring out of him over his last year or two? It's a great point. You know, one of the things uh, when I think about the toughness, the competitive feature that Indiana basketball should always have as it really is to this team, it's Rob Fennessy. Like we, we've got to get Rob Fennessy back to being a NBA type defender. I mean, he's that good in my opinion. And, and like you said, thanks for bringing that up, Mike, but um, you know, he's, he's the leader up front. That's your first line of defense. And if his mind is elsewhere, your defense is going to struggle. You know, the first line of defense, um, that's, that's something where pride gets in, you know, comes into play. And if you don't have someone up there that takes it, takes it personal when some, when the other team scores, like I think a Rob Finnessy does, then, then that's a problem. And so that's one of my first objectives coming here is, you know, they, they Stella figured out how to get her groove back. We got to get Rob Finnessy to figure out how to get his groove back. And I don't think there's a better defender in the league than, than Rob Finnessy. And you can make money and you can gain confidence with defense. I mean, I lasted four years with, with crappy offense and still played a lot of minutes and, uh, it, it worked out for me in the end. I got a little bit of offensive confidence. I could actually dribble the ball. Um, but I think, you know, my personal story, as you said, Mike, is, is a lot like fantasies where, um, you know, defense is, is his niche. It's his niche and he can make money doing it if he really puts his mind to it. Uh, and he will get confidence through good defense as well. We got to get him back because to me, he's the best defender in the big 10. Jojo. Hi, Coach. Jojo Gentry with CBS4 here. I'd like to know how you would describe the kind of coaching style you're looking to implement with this group, and how do you expect these players to respond to it? 
Could you ask that question one more time? I was, I thought you were at uh, um, uh, Lucas Oil Field. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm actually in line to get vaccinated right now. It's a little loud. Um, For you. I, so if you can't hear me, just let, allow me no, to. No, you're good. You're good. All right. I just wanted to know how would you describe the kind of coaching style you're looking to implement with this group, and how do you expect the players to respond to it? Well, I think once again, you got to kind of adjust to your boss's temperament. And um, I think there'll be some good cop, bad cop at times. Um, you know, as much as um, I've got to adjust to Coach Woodson, Coach Woodson's dealing with a whole new dynamic. You know, he's dealing with kids that are sometimes 17 and they're right from their parents' homes. You know, for the most part at the NBA level, he's dealing with men. You know, at times he's dealing with 19, 20 year olds, but he's dealing with men that have been on their own for a while. And now he's, he's dealing with kids that still might look in the stands at their parents when something's going wrong. And that's not always the case, but, um, you know, there's adjustment that, that we've got to help Coach Woodson deal with too. And the great thing about it is he doesn't have an ego. And uh, he should, but he doesn't. You know, when we're sitting here in a, in a staff meeting, we've been in a few of them. It's really neat to be able to say something. And he's like, oh, okay. Okay, I can see where you're right on that. And... It's it's um, I'm really looking forward to learning, um, you know, what what Coach Woodson has to offer. You know, I've been in a couple meetings where he's just talked X's and O's, and it's fascinating to just see how advanced and hear how advanced it is at that level. And then flip side, we get more primitive here at college basketball. Like, Coach, you got to think back to when you raised your two daughters and they were 16, 17, 18. And, um, you know, what would you have said then as opposed to the most of the people you deal with now at your level? And uh, there's give and take. And, you know, we've got Coach Mata, we've got Coach Roberts, we've got Kenya, we've got some support staff that we've kept here. And, um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of blending here. And I think it's going to be a, a perfect scenario for our players. Because when Coach Woodson speaks, it's like he's speaking to Carmelo Anthony or uh, Allen Iverson. Whereas when I speak, it's it's more geared towards the Trace Jackson Davises or the Gary Harris's or the guys that coached at Michigan State. Um, and, you know, we can learn a lot. Coach Woodson and I and the staff, we can learn a lot from each other. And I think it's going to work out great for our players. Dustin. Hey, Coach. Dustin DePirac from the Daily Hoosier. Um, you mentioned earlier, you, you're just talking about this just coaching at Indiana and what it's like, um, you know, be, being around Indiana, what do you, you think it's just the value of having, uh, you know, a head coach and also a, a top assistant coach like yourself, just having been an Indiana grad and having an idea of what this is like going into it to, um, I guess, both to kind of bring the IU, you know, alum family back in, but also just to have people in those positions that have played in this spot. Well, you know, I was talking to one of our support staff members the other day and um, I won't, I won't name a name and he didn't do anything wrong, but, he kind of, um, I was asking him for, for a favor to do something. And he kind of said, well, that's this person's job. And I said, well, you're in the office and this part, the other person's not in the office, works at another part of the, the um, athletic department. And it was something that, that needed to be done and needed to be done what I felt with, with passion and the thought that, you know, this, it's, it's do or die every time you do something. And I think, you know, relating to your question, Dustin, that, you know, Coach Woodson, there's just a little bit more passion when you're trying to sell Indiana or when you're selling Indiana to a family or a student, uh, potential student athlete. There's a little bit more passion behind um, a loss at um, Purdue or a win at Purdue. Um, that doesn't discredit any of the coaches that have been here because they've done a great job in their own right. But to me, uh, Indiana is a really, really unique place. And it's a place where it requires somebody that understands the dynamic, um, the beast that it is. And it also is somebody that, that understands the massive alumni base, the passion they have. Uh, this is, I've always said, I want to come back and coach in Indiana. Why? Because of the passion for basketball. Why? Because people know basketball. And like it's, it's unlike any other place in the world. And with that in mind, 
I've always felt that in Indiana basketball, the Indiana basketball job by and large should be coached by somebody who played or coached here or spent a lot of time here. And I think coach Woodson's perfect at this time. And I think that um, coach Woodson had in mind that he was going to bring in others that um, had the same passion that he did. And I do believe that this is the right move to once again, to bring everyone together because as I said, the team was good enough last year to be in the NCAA tournament minimum. And I, as much as I, we can all blame the staff and the players, everybody plays a role. And what I saw was just people picking and picking and picking at our program and everybody jumped on board and it just created a giant uh, snowball and an avalanche that couldn't be stopped. And so I felt for Archie and his staff and I felt for the former players. And to be fair, you know, I've been, I, we, we were booed off the floor two or three times when I played here. You know, it, it wasn't like when they got booed in um, where, wherever, where was it? Uh, Lucas Oil was a Big Ten tournament that, it, that Indiana hasn't been booed before. Everybody's making a big deal about that. Hell, we've been booed uh, up 20 walking off the floor with Coach Knight. And uh, seems like some people forget. Well, I think it's a good time for me to be here to remind people that um, Indiana fans don't typically boo. And I was disappointed that they did boo, but, um, you know, it, it made me mad. And I'm not afraid to lecture a few people because this is my program. This is your program. This is Coach Woodson's program. And if anybody has a right to crit criticize or, or stick up for it, it's us. Kevin. Yeah, uh, Coach Kevin Brockway from uh, CNHI uh, Indiana. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the job. Thanks, Kevin. Um, secondly, um, you, you know, you alluded to Coach Izzo. Uh, obviously, you spent a lot of years with him, 10 years with him. Uh, first of all, what was his reaction when he took the job? And secondly, uh, what do you think you will take from your 10 years uh, from him that you could kind of bring to the program in terms of maybe what you've learned along the way? Well, Coach Izzo has always known that I've, my, my dream is to coach at Indiana, is to be the coach at Indiana. And um, I've never really shied away from that. And so when this job came open, my first objective was to try to get the head job. And I made no bones about it with him. But my second objective is if they get a former player that I, or they get a coach that I like and respect, I think change is good. Change is good for me. Um, change is ultimately good for most. And 10 years is a long time to be somewhere. And Coach Izzo agreed with that. And when Coach Woodson got the job, it really was an easy decision. And I just thought if, if he called and offered me the right position and the right description and gave me the right responsibilities that I felt I'd earned and had a right to ask for, I was going to do it. And so it was pretty easy. And uh, what was your sec the second part of your question, Kevin? Uh, just what you, you took from him um, in terms of the 10 years, what, what you learned, what you gained, how you grew under him and how that can translate into uh, this position uh, at this time. Well, most importantly is how to help a young man improve. Um, you know, with Coach Izzo, he, he asked for somebody, the minute they come in, a recruit, player, parents, um, what the goals are. You know, it's one thing to say during the recruiting process what their goals are, but when they get there, what are your goals? Where do you think you are? And once you put those goals down, he deems it his responsibility to hold them to that uh, every day. And that's really what it is. It's an everyday process. And guess who's involved? The parents, the people that are in the kid's ear. And you can bet that, um, you know, it, it may sound a little high school hairy, but I'm going to be in the ears of everybody that's involved with the player. Everybody that impacts the student athlete, I'm going to be involved. We're going to be involved because that's the only way, because every little piece, uh, and unfortunately you've got the social media, but Every time that somebody casts doubt in that kid's ear, that's one more step away from their goals. And so is it invasive? Yes. Is it uh, being in their kid in your kid's business? Yes. But for any of you that have coached out there, um, if you coach somebody long enough, you start to care about them. 
And if you start to care about them long enough, they start to kind of mimic the way you treat your own kids for those that have kids. And, you know, there's a line in coaching where you say, gosh, you know, sometimes I want it worse than you. And that's true. But you find that you're saying the same stuff to your kids and their own goals. And uh, there's some mimicry there where you just get so desperate for, for to help your, your players understand. But, you know, there's, there's a new beast out there. And that's where everybody's trying to be the, the hero and make money or make fame off of these kids, especially at this level. And if you're not, if A, if someone doesn't keep their circle tight, or you're not plugged in to what's going on and what, what's being said to your student athlete, it's a problem. And so you've got to be, you've got to be in tune with everybody that's in this kid's ear. Zach. Mike, are you at the, or Kevin, are you at the beach? Yeah, I came down to Florida a few days ago, and I've lost my base tan. So it's it, yeah, it's like lost what, what part there, Studley? I like the tan. Uh, West West Palm, West Palm Beach. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Physics good looking, family, yeah. Maybe a little burnt. Maybe a little sunscreen for you I, today. I put on I put on thirty, and uh, it it didn't work. Fifties the play. Maybe a hat. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do golf next time? Yeah. Do you go, Do you golf? Uh no no fishing. So I'm out in the water. What'd you catch? Uh, yeah, some kingfish, king mackerel, stuff like that. So, you know, yeah, good stuff. Maybe a hat, some sunscreen. Yeah. Coming from a yeah, guy my, that's my, had melanoma. Let's do my, it. My skin doesn't, it's two years in Indiana. My skin doesn't react the way it used to. I lived in Florida 18 years before that. So I'm thinking right here. Yep. <laughs> Jim Coyle. How am I going to follow that, man? Um, they, how are you doing, man? That real hair? <laughs> are you talking about me or are you talking about kevin yeah. is that the fake hair hat that's no man oh yeah fake hair hat. you know it's that's the real stuff brother okay. that's the real stuff uh yeah. nice to see you again how are you good to see you jim uh i've got my sunscreen all lined up though i'm really good to go i'm, I'm not on vacation like i'm here working hard uh, like covering you, you guys on. you got 50 on now you look like me Exactly. It's uh, working too hard. Hey, talking about all the things that you have as far as your passion and all of that, there's a lot of fractures in the program, even in the fans, because there's so many different eras from Coach Knight's era, uh, whether it's Sampson, uh, Crean, uh, Miller, you got all these groups now, but there's also groups in the fans. There's a lot of just a lot of fractures. Yes. Winning does a lot for that. But there's a lot that needs to be brought back together. You're obviously, the, I think, the guy to do that. But why is that? And what is part of what you're planning on doing to bring all of that together? Well, like you said, winning is important. But I think when Coach Knight left, it, it, it brought about um, a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, some uncertainty, uncertainty and we, instability. And I think... Since then, it's really left people in wonderment, especially the new generation, the younger generations of Indiana. What, what, what is, where is this Indiana basketball that's so great? And they've never really been able to attach themselves to what makes this place so special. And, you know, it just seems like we have a bunch of Yankees and Red Sox fans that are fine when we're good and they're brutal when we lose but that's not the way it used to be yeah we were booed off the court but those same people showed up the next time cheering their heads off you know the balconies were filled um, to play a, a team that was out of a conference that they'd never heard of and um, it's okay to get upset but but you know what what's going on now is is pretty superficial and you know um what do they call it? Fair weather fanish. And, and I understand it. I really do. Uh, we have to get some stability here. And I think coach Woodson uh, and the staff here is, is going to dig in and get out to these small towns and visit with these former players because we all have a responsibility. And uh, you guys do too, this massive media following you guys do too. So when you're bitching about our team, you know, that's fine, but if you're wrong, if I think you're wrong, you know, I'm going to call you 
And if you think our offense is wrong, I'd like for maybe you guys to call us or call me. I don't know where Woody stands on that, but you know, if you guys are going to be putting the message out there, let's just make sure we're getting it right. And um, that involves working together. Uh, we'll tell you as much as we can, but um, you know, just make sure you get the stories on, on what's going on. And because uh, you know, on, Unfortunately or fortunately, you guys know what you're talking about. And uh, I know you got to sell papers and sell clicks, but um, you also got to get it right, be fair. Uh, and we'll try to be fair with you guys. But this, this place, um, I think we'll mend a lot of fences here, Jim, just by virtue of Coach Woodson being here, you know, connecting the old with the young. And, and by, the, by the older guys coming back, the older fans coming back and and helping this younger, newer generation, um, I think it's going to do a lot of do a lot of education and teaching um, to these to these newer, younger generations and the students that we have now. You know, we got to we got to talk the we got to talk the word too. We got to talk it. We got to talk about how special this place still is and should be. Mike Pegram. Pigs. Hey, Dane. Um, Mike I just go to the Peds tailgate, everybody, before <laughs> Midnight Madness. That's a, that is a sign of being all in. Yeah, good times. Uh, Got to go, set it back to midnight then to make it happen. Um, uh, past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, what were your first thoughts when you heard that Mata was going to be involved with, with the program? And also, how well did you know Kenya Hunter – before all this and how you might you two complement each other? Well, Thad Mata, um, gosh, I remember back when he was at Xavier and I wouldn't have thought he knew who I was. And we just happened to maybe be eating next to each other in a hotel, um, eating breakfast. And he had stopped and introduced himself. And I was, I think a GA at Indiana. And he said, if there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. And um, it just goes such a long way for little things like that. And then he coached at Ohio State while we were at um, Indiana. And um, I've just always thought of him as a, most importantly, just a high character person. And so when I found out he was here or coming here, um, and then when I had the opportunity, it was, it was golden for me because you're working for a coach. I can't remember how many years he was at Ohio State, but he's been a head coach for a long time. And he's just a great person. He's a, such a positive person to be around. And his wife, Barbara, I get to know, um, you know what? It's just somebody that you can really learn from that's been in the business, that's taken the hits, you know, that's, that's, had to walk away from a great job. Uh, it's just been through it and won at a high, high level. So this is a perfect scenario for us, you know, myself and obviously our head coach, Coach Woodson. I was fired up to find out he's here and I just hope he'll stay for a long, long time. Kenya Hunter, I got to know Kenya when he was at Nebraska. He worked with Michael Lewis and um, if he's good with Michael, he's good with me and I think it just rings true. He's a great worker. Um, he's what I would say a complete coach where he's not just uh, an X's and O's guy or recruiter. He does the whole thing. And Kenya's going to be, to me, a great head coach someday um, just because he, he kind of knows everything that can make a program go. He's got a great understanding for it. So complimenting each other. Um, I don't think we'll miss a beat as far as the staff, especially as it goes with my, myself and Kenya. Thanks. Alec. Hey coach, Alec Lassley, uh, the Hoosier.com. Um, can you just talk a little bit about facing Indiana twice last year, knowing a little bit about the roster already? What do you like about it and where are some rooms that you really need to kind of progress and get better? Well, I'm, I haven't had a chance to talk to Finnessy yet about it, but we beat him last year because Rob Finnessy, uh, he didn't hawk the ball like he did. Now I say that with a smirk, but 
Um, I like their team. As I said, they were, a, they were to me an NCAA tournament team. Um, and I think we've got to get back to the, you know, we were a minus three and rebounding, you know, you got big trace and race up front. That shouldn't happen. You know, and you got toughness with Rob Finnessy, um, you know, as the head of the snake, that's, that's a critical part. And so, um, we got those three coming back. So you got defense and rebounding. You got somebody setting the tone right up front, and then you've got those two guys at the back line. We've got to get we've got to get more from Trace on the defensive end. You know, I think he averaged just about ten in conference rebounding. We got to get that to thirteen. You know, we've got to get him and Race fight for balls above the rim every possession. You know, that's fine. Maybe they both need uh, face masks because at least we know they're they're going after it. Um, you know, the one thing that I'm definitely going to bring is the, the defending and rebounding intensity, uh, from Michigan state, you know, and I think coach Woodson's already said that that's got to be a staple anyway, Well, we're going to take it to another level here, Lord willing, and get these guys to understand that, you know, those last four or five, six games that they lost, they were in it under two minutes. And those are the things aside from free throw shooting that'll get you beat is if you don't defend it and come up with those loose balls and, and uh, you know, control those possessions when it matters. Ken. Coach Ken Bykoff from uh, Pigs.com. I can assure you this is my real hair. Um, hey, here. that's sharp. That is sharp. <laughs> that's correct. Uh, what's that? It fresh this morning? Uh, over the weekend, anyway. Well, maybe uh, uh, we need better HD on this computer. Uh, yeah, internet. well, I, everybody needs that. Um, so you went through a firing uh, and a transition, obviously, as a player to the point that even in the moment you talked about possibly transferring and, and, and all of that, you, you stayed. How did that experience as a player kind of help you coming into this situation when players are going through some of the same kind of emotions? Well, at the time I came to play for Coach Knight and I do it all over again. My issue was that I, I was told that they weren't bringing, I, I'd, I'd said all along, look, we're going to respect what President Brand just did. Um, well, at least I was. And if they keep Coach Davis and Trelor, I just assumed that was the natural progression of it. It was too late, um, you know, into the fall and going into the preseason that I felt they could bring in another coach other than a recycled coach. Um, and so once I found out that, um, you know, they were going to keep coach Davis and tree that was, that was an easy decision to me. And the reason was, is my teammates and it was Indiana basketball. And so it's just, you know, I didn't want to play for somebody new, new system, um, that didn't represent potentially what I, what I, you know, came to play here for. And honestly, I was going to go play at Michigan state and, you know, I was going to pay my own way. And, um, for a year at least and go to Michigan state because coach Izzo was the, to me, the kind of the Indiana of, of, of Michigan at the time. And um, he was making headway as far as competing for championships. And, but, you know, guys like Kirk Haston and, um, you know, Coverdale and Jared Odell and, um, you know, you can go down the list, Jared Jeffries, Jeff Newton, those guys, Moye, um, they were like my brothers and that's what ultimately it, it comes down to is, um, you know, it's family and, and it, but it has to be lived every day. And that's why I decided to come back and it was an easy decision for me. Did that experience kind of uh, help you with the players uh, now kind of help them work through some of their emotions? Well, I didn't do a very good job with Brunk, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a lot of time, but um, here's the thing, like kids, there's so many, more, there's so many more distractions. There's so many more people involved in these kids' lives with opinions that it's, it's really easy. And I'm not suggested this happened to Joey, but it's so easy to get sidetracked and get distracted with social media and people just constantly pecking at you if you don't have your circle tight, but that's on the staff too. You know, we got to know what's, what's being, we got to look for signs. We got to be investigators. We got to be almost FBI to know what's being thrown in these kids' faces and going in their ears. Um, there's just so many 
people out there with an agenda that have access to our players. You know, they had the same access at Michigan State. And if you're not plugged in, especially around these, especially during this time where the portal's open and um, everybody's painting a picture of the grass being greener somewhere else, um, you get somebody that didn't have a great year and doesn't have, um, you know, the self-confidence of, of betting on themselves, you know, that's, that's, they're ripe for the picking and, you know, every program's dealing with it. And the ones that are plugged into their players and make sure they're, they're answering questions and, you know, eliminating doubts is as much as anything. And, you know, great teammates play a role. And that's the thing that, you know, I was talking to Anthony Leal about this morning is, you know, if, if you don't know a teammate struggling, then you really got your head in the sand as much as a coach does. You know, here you got to, we got to preach teammate support too, you know, and if you feel you can't get through to a teammate as a player, you got to talk to the staff and let them know that a teammate's struggling. That's as important as anything. And so there's going to be a lecture to the staff today as much as there'll be a lecture to the players. I appreciate it. Welcome back to Bloomington. Thanks, Ken. Aaron. Hi, Coach Aaron Matus from WDRB in Louisville. I was actually watching some old video and old press conferences from uh, you back in the day. And uh, I think it was in Atlanta, you said, this is where Indiana belongs in uh, final fours and final eights. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, almost 20 years later, does that comment still hold water, <laughs> so to speak, or do you need to earn that? Eventually, yeah. Well, that was at the time. That was, you know, that was 20 years ago. You got me, you got me, but you know what, Aaron, that's a good point. It's a good question, not in a condescending way. Um, you know, we, we are fragmented. And like I said, we, we, we as a, the state of Indiana basketball has got to be, uh, there's still some missing pieces. And I think we all, Coach Woodson, myself, we all can talk the talk, but we've got to dig in with people figured out and there's no one person that's causing a problem it's really just takes man hours it takes work it takes time on the clock that we've got to invest and it's got to be a complete and full investment but it takes the right understanding you know we've got to get out into these communities you know when covid you know when covid's done and and reinvest in in the things that you know, really helped coach Knight, you know, and the coaches before the players before this still is a community deal. I mean, I can remember traveling the state, um, sitting in gyms, even as a player here, uh, high school gyms, um, barnstorming tours, camps, um, going up to play golf, uh, not very good, but different golf outings. Those are the things that that protect the do not just to engage with people and engage with alumni and more or less just to tell them thank you um, by being there. That's your way of saying thank you. But um, when you recognize that we're not just Instagram, um, we're not just uh, Instagram sensations or Twitter sensations, and you recognize that Trace Jackson Davis is one of the nicest kids you'll ever meet. Race Thompson, incredible kid. Finnessy, incredible kid. Leo Galloway. These are kids that grew up just like you guys, myself, um, Coach Woodson, that they're still the same dudes, you know? And instead of doing our social media things, you know, and sending out pictures after wins or losses, Let's, let's go out and sign autographs. Let's go into these communities. Let's go to, to Newcastle or Fort Wayne or Elkhart or Kokomo or um, uh, Clarksville and, and be with, with the fans, the people that love this, this program and tell them thank you. And I don't want anybody crying on this, okay? I, it looks like... Uh, Dylan looks like he's about to cry here, get sentimental. But I think the reality is, is none of that really happens anymore. 
And I don't think it's anybody's fault, but it's just something that I know has to happen in order for this to, to work, you know, as, as, we, as, you, as you mentioned, the way it's supposed to work. And it doesn't mean that we're winning the national championship next year. It doesn't mean that we're going to the Elite Eight because I'm not sure how it's going to unfold next year. I can tell you how it's going to unfold, but nobody really knows. This portal and these players coming and going everywhere around the country, who knows? I couldn't tell you how good the Big Ten or bad the Big Ten is going to be next year. Um, but what I can tell you is when we can get out and get into these communities, you can bet that that me and my daughters, my two little girls, they're going to see what Indiana basketball is all about. You know, and if if uh, we go down to Louisville, we still expect people to be in their candy stripes and come up to say hello. You know, I, I think that, you know, there'll still be some old grannies or grandpas may come up and ask if I'm still playing, which, you know, I'd say, you still, you still play? How many more years you got? But uh, it's... Um, that's, that's how you build. That's how you rebuild. And that's how you reestablish this culture that was so strong when I was here. Okay, we got time for two more questions. John. Hi, uh, this is John Blau with the Herald Times in Bloomington. Um, I saw or I heard an interview you had with Dan Dockett. You were talking about your uh, two kids are actually Michigan State fans. Uh, have you done anything yet to kind of break them of that? Or kind of where are you in that process? Well, we can always buy their love and buy their fandom with candy, and junk food. We're going to do it more organically, not with organic candy and junk food, but just let them figure it out. They're going to come down here and they'll realize real quick that um, whether you're a boiler or a Spartan, they're, they're, they're respectful for the most part, but they're going to see that this is a pretty special place. You know, my eight year old booed me yesterday, um, but she did have a candy stripe, uh, you know, hair tie on and she didn't even know what she, my wife slipped one on her head. Um, and she said she liked it. So she liked the cream and crimson. She didn't even realize what she was doing. Um, you know, my wife's Indiana grad too. And um, she's kind of subtly been brainwashing them their whole lives. So I think once they get down here, they'll be switched over and won't even know what, no, won't even know what hit them. Okay. Last question, Olivia. Hi, Coach. Olivia Ray here with Wish TV and also a proud Indiana grad. So as you were getting sentimental there a couple of questions ago, uh, I want you to get back in that mindset and tell me how you felt walking back in Assembly Hall for the first time, now being back a part of the Indiana program. Did it feel the same? Did it feel completely different? Have you hit up any of your favorite spots being back in town? Yeah. Well, Assembly Hall, you know, the COVID version, uh, happened last year and, uh, you know, the years prior. Um, but now that I'm back, I guess on the right side, that's, a, it's funny you ask. Um, I just, I can't wait to sneak in. I still haven't had time just to go sit in the bleach or sit in the chairs, sit in the chairs where maybe my grandparents sat or my parents sat and watched me where the families would sit. I'd always look up there and see who was there watching. Um, so many stories come back to me, funny stories during practice with Coach Knight or Coach Davis or funny stories, um, you know, during games, um, stuff that would happen. It's it, it just not much has changed, Olivia, and that's what's really unique about it. It's just they, they really haven't done much. You know, you look up at, you know, the, the suite, the, the 76, I can't remember the name of it, but the 70 spirit of 76 suite. And that's, that is really neat. And that's something that's a great addition. Um, but the bleachers are still the same, you know, that the, when you, when you back the bleachers up, you still can't get to the top of the, the very top of the three point line and get a good shot there. And I think that, you know, talking X's and O's with coach Woodson, there's just so many things that, that, that reflect the things he learned from, we both learned from Coach Knight. It's really neat to go back to what would be deemed primitive, but in the end, 
all the things that Coach Knight would teach transcend time. What worked then worked now. And it's, it's really just hard work, dedication, being all in, being coachable, and trusting the process, which nobody does anymore. Um, eating spots, um, I was really disappointed. And I think uh, we really got to get to work on this. We need the media. To, Opie Taylor's was one of my favorite spots. Opie Taylor was one of my favorite spots. And I was really broken hearted when I found out it had closed and, you know, susceptible or succumbed to COVID. But Malibu's always been good to me. Um, I like hole in the walls, so I'm looking for new hole in the wall spots. And then, um, you know, I would eat at Convenient Mart a lot. I don't, I don't know how the sandwiches are, but I'd eat at Convenient Mart a lot. And uh, I'm just looking forward to mooching off the program a little bit. Leftover scraps. I was famous for doing that. I'm pretty cheap. I've got the alligator arms. I've been known to forget my wallet a time or two when, when it's time to go out to dinner. And, uh, I, but there's no shame in it. I come by it. I'm as, honestly, I'm cheap and have alligator arms and, you know, pray to God every time that someone foots the bill. Uh, 